On Larry King Now, the Academy Award winner Angelica Houston on her famous roots. I wanted to be an actress, but I didn't necessarily want to work for him as a director. I wanted to work for practically anyone else. Whoopi turned to Penelope in that beautiful voice of Whoopi's and said, you're never going to be the same person again. Now you're Penelope Cruz, Oscar winner. And it, that's what it is. It's, it's like being reborn in some way. Plus. With Woody, you know, he comes up to you and you're expecting some huge piece of directorial advice and he'll say, you'll be out of here by 4.30. <laughs> It's all next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now, our special guest, the delightful, talented Angelica Houston, the Academy Award winning actress, Emmy winning director, and now author. No doubt she'll get awards for that, too, like the National Book Award. And so many memorable roles in The Royal Tenenbaums and Preetzee's Honor and The Addams Family, to name just a few. And I love Smash. Her book is a story lately told, coming of age in Ireland, London, and New York, the first of Angelica's two-part memoirs. The second book, called Watch Me, will be published in 2014. Why two books? Why didn't you just do it all at once? Well, I did, actually, all at once. I, I came up with about 900 pages, and I think uh, just the sheer force of, 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 of having so much material uh, caused my publisher, Nan Graham, to say, I think it's a better idea if we do two books. It's been sensationally reviewed. It, it, isn't it hard to let it all out? Actually, for me, it was um, just the opposite. I, I, I was trepidatious at first. I, 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 I was a bit worried. And then I thought, well, I'm just going to write without censorship. I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to hold myself to any rules. I'm was just going to write. It was, at times, painful if I was writing about painful things. But I think so much better that it... If you feel um, that pain, then you don't yeah. feel when you're when you're writing well, about the decision to it. write it. Yeah. How did that come about? Um, well, I guess I've been in the movie business now for over forty years, and there's only so much people know about me. What's funny is that I've done a lot of junkets. I've talked about myself a lot. I've talked about my roles, but I think uh, people don't really know a tremendous amount about my life before I came to Hollywood. You lost your mother young, right? Yes, I did. You were 17. Yes. What effect did that have? Um, well, I never got over it. I never go on a trip without thinking it's possible that I might not come back. I, I never get into a car without thinking of the possibilities of, of what can happen. Your father lived to an old age, right? Did he not? Um, How old was he? Well, John? not that old, 82, but, but not, I, I, I don't consider that old anymore. Not when I'm Walter? looking at you, Larry. <laughs> How about Walter? Walter died in his 60s, actually, of a heart aneurysm, which my father also had to have a, a, a big heart operation. Did you know Walter well? I didn't know him at all. He died a, a year before I was born. But I got to know him through the movies. And Yankee Doodle Dandy. That's right. And the at father first, of, of course, Jimmy Cagney. That's right. I thought he was the little old prospector and treasure of Sierra Madre. Sure, yeah. And then I saw Dodsworth and... He was something else entirely. So then I realized, of course, my grandpa was an actor. Your father did a few movies too, right? My father did just a few, yes. What do you, th you think he'd like this book? Um, I hope so. It's a little hard to tell since um, he was unusual and, and um, had his own opinions. And I'm sure there'd be things um, that he would be interested in in the book. And mm. other things, probably that not like. No, maybe I don't know. It's a little bit hard. I think actually knowing my father, he was very much like my brother um, Tony in in his judgments, and Tony felt that the book was fair, and I think my father would have probably had the same instinct. So the second book's already written. It is for mm. the most part. This book takes us to what age? 
Um, to about 22. Before you began acting? Um, no, I'd, I'd already done a movie with my father when I was 17, um, and which was uh, an interesting experience. Not a very good experience. Oh, why? Well, um, I... Uh, I wanted to be an actress, but I didn't necessarily want to work for him as a director. I wanted to work for practically anyone else um, because I was rebellious and a bit of an obstinate teenager. And um, I, uh, there was also a school search going on um, by Franco Zeffirelli for Juliet, for Romeo and Juliet, and I'd been called back a couple of times and I really wanted to do that. But my dad had other ideas and so, I, I made this movie with him, Walk with Love and Death, in uh, in Vienna, and it was a it was a difficult experience. I was very badly reviewed. We were both very badly reviewed. He was accused of nepotism, and um, I was accused of being unattractive, and it was all same very thing bad. happened to <laughs> Francis Coppola. I did with Godfather Three. Yes, when he cast his daughter, right? That's right. I she was very rapid. sympathetic with <laughs> Sophia because she took she took the brunt too. Was there was there a sense in the book of clearing up things? Um, I want to I want you to know this, you know, kind of thing. To a degree, I don't have uh, any bone to chew though with either of my parents. I I'm very lucky in that, I I was on great terms with both of them. Um, before they left the planet, and I think that's terribly important. I, there's nobody, really, that I want to point a finger at um, or say, Good. you didn't understand me, who you should have understood with, me better. Who came up with the great title? Um, well, it's, it's from a poem, an Irish poem, uh, about magpies. Magpies are black and white birds that, that often Dip, go to the potato fields to pick worms. They're kind of like crows, but black and white. And and uh, the poem goes, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a wedding, four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven for a sto story lately told. So, you know, when you're in the car driving along those Irish roads, you're always spotting magpies. What was Ireland like? Ireland was a phenomenal place to grow up green and um, underpopulated, if you hmm. can imagine. How old were you when you left? Um, Eleven to go to school in England, and then, um, but I didn't really leave Ireland. I never really left Ireland, and Ireland's still in my heart. She has had some notable lovers. We're talking about the men in Angelica's life after the break. The book is a story lately told. The guest is Angelica Houston. Uh, you were faced with the reality of, and write brilliantly about this, of the infidelity of your parents, both of them. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Your father had a lover, your mother had a lover. They had children, right? They weren't just lover, a, a lover. They both had lovers. Um, and um, I think at the time when I first discovered um, that fact, I, it was disturbing to me. Who did you discover it about first? Uh, my father. Um, my, uh, uh, he, he had a little box in his bathroom and my brother ch showed me some photographs in, in, that were in the little box. And um, I was very shocked. Yes, I was very shocked. And, and, uh, but at the same time, my father's girlfriends were always wonderful and beautiful and let me try on their makeup and wear their stockings and their high heels. So I liked them very much. How about your mother's boyfriends? Um, I liked my mother's boyfriends less. <laughs> I guess they didn't have stockings to <laughs> offer me. Um, now, how did you deal with this? You're how old now? About um, nine or ten. Pretty young, didn't you? Yeah. They? Um, but actually, I mean, I say I like them less, my mother's, my mother's lovers, but um, they were, they were, everyone was nice to me. How about your own part? Bob Richardson was a, an older partner, right? You write about him. Bob Richardson was uh, in his 40s when I first met him, um, and I had, had barely hit my 20s. Um, he was an extremely gifted photographer. 
a very sensitive, uh, very, very moving person. Was he a suicide? He he had he had been suicidal in his life. He'd also uh, been uh, a patient of Dr. Max Jacobson, who was known for. Uh, putting famous people on on a cocktail of drugs. Um, Dr. Feelgood. Dr. Feelgood. And a lot of people were kind of victimized by this doctor, uh, Bob included. And um, But apart from that, Bob had some, some serious emotional and mental problems. And that must have left something on you, some mark on you. It did, yes. Um, and I was unprepared for it. I, I didn't, I had no idea about mental illness. I didn't know about um, being bipolar or schizophrenia or any number of... He was all the above? He was all of the above. I would imagine we'll learn more about Jack Nicholson in book two. I right? imagine. Yes, He's not in you book will. one, is he? I don't know that there's, there's much about Jack that that people don't know, but maybe but my in, point of view. He's not in book one. He's not no. in book one, no. Jack is very, just one thing on him. He called me before my last week on CNN, and I can't imitate it, but you know, Larry, I really love to do your show. I watch you all the time. But if I did your show, I'd have to do everybody else, and I don't want to do anybody else. Why? Why does he refrain from the spotlight? I think um, it's not that he refrains from the spotlight. He, he refrains from television, and he's never done television. Um, and that's been a personal choice. The only time you'll see Jack on television is at the Laker game. Right. Other than that, he's a film actor, and he's always been very, he's always adhered to that. Um, and I think maybe it's part of his mythology. Stick. Not just shtick, but I think it's a, a conscious choice. I don't think he wants to be in your living room, apart from uh, if he's at the, at the Laker game. I don't know that he wants to be that friendly guy that you feel so, you know, what was so it? close to on television. What was it like? I imagine we'll see a lot of it in the next book, but I'll stay a step ahead because this is going to be a major bestseller anyway. Um, to hear your name announced on Oscar night. Uh, it, One of my all-time favorite movies, by the way. Thank you. It was thrilling and chilling and completely intimidating. And, um, you know, you see people year after year with that Oscar in their hand at every, at, at, at every uh, Oscar ceremony. And you think, what is it about this? You know, we watch this performance year after year. What is it about this moment? And it's because it's never happened to that person before. And I can only say that it's, you know, you kind of enter a delirium. I remember when um, Penelope Cruz got her Oscar and Whoopi Goldberg and Tilda Swinton and, um, oh, there were a few of us on stage, Goldie Hawn. And anyway, we took her off backstage, and we were walking down this corridor, and there are all of these photographs on, the, uh, on either side of, of past winners. And Whoopi turned to Penelope in that beautiful voice of Whoopi's and said, you're never going to be the same person again. Now you're Penelope Cruz, Oscar winner. And it, that's what it is. It's it's like being reborn in some way. <laughs> Isn't announced? that a ridiculous thing who, to no, say? But it is. Who announced your name? Um, Richard Dreyfus and Martha and uh, Marsha Mason. Marsha Mason. That was... And they were very tiny. I remember they were yeah, this both big small. on stage. <laughs> and I, it took forever to get up there. It was like wading through water. It was great. My guess is the great Angelica Houston. And maybe we'll hear a passage from a story lately told. Stay with us. The book is a story lately told. The guest is Angelica Houston. How did Lauren Bacall help? 
Well, Lauren Bacall was there when, uh, when my father received the uh, news that I was alive. It, he was in um, the Belgian Congo in Uganda making the African Queen. And I was just born um, in the Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in right Los here. Angeles, exactly. And the, the news of my birth was cabled to the township of Butaiba, and a barefoot runner uh, took off <laughs> and, and ran for three days through the jungle till he got to the location of the African Queen, where my father was directing Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart. Lauren Bacall was there. She'd been cooking for the crew, and uh, and Dad received the telegram from the barefoot runner and and uh, read it and put it in his pocket. And Katie Hepburn said, "For God's sakes, John, what does it say?" And he said, "It's a girl. Her name is Angelica." So that's sort of how it all started. She's a great girl, Lauren Bacall. Yeah, she is. Betty. She's a dear friend. <laughs> all right, read something from a story lately told. Okay, this is the prologue. Ah. There was a shrine in my mother's bedroom when I was growing up. The built-in wardrobe had a mirror on the interior of both doors and a bureau inside, higher than I was, with an array of perfume bottles and small objects on the surface and a, war and a wall of burlap stretched above it. Pinned to the burlap was a collage of things she'd collected, pictures that she'd torn out of magazines, poems, pomander balls, a fox's tail tied with a red ribbon, a brooch I'd bought her at, from Woolworths that spelled mother in Malachite, a photograph of Siobhan McKenna as St. Joan. Standing between the glass doors, I loved to look at her possessions, the mirrors reflecting me into infinity. I was a lonely child. My brother Tony and I were never very close, neither as children nor as adults, but I was tightly bound to him. We were forced to be together because we were on our own, really. Although I knew he loved me, I always felt that Tony had it in for me a bit, and that a year older than I, he was always having to fight for what he had. We were in the middle of the Irish countryside in County Galway in the west of Ireland, and we didn't see many other kids. We were tutored, and my life was mostly fantasy wishing that I were Catholic so that I could have a Holy Communion <laughs> and wearing my mother's tutus on the front lawn, hoping a husband would come along so that I might marry him. I also spent quite a lot of time in front of the bathroom mirror. Nearby there was a stack of books. My favorites were The Death of Manolete and the cartoons of Charles Adams. I would pretend to be Morticia Adams. I was drawn to her. I used to pull my eyes back and see how I'd look with slanted eyelids. I liked Sophia Lauren a lot. I'd seen pictures of her, and she was my ideal of female beauty at the time. Beautiful. Thank you. Right. So the Adams family it was prophetic. I know. How about that? <laughs> how about that? Uh, you wrote by hand with a pencil? I did, yes. With the paper mate Sharp Master number two. Did you like writing? I love writing. And Why not I would sooner find then? Well, I've written all my life, and I've, I've written prologues and right, forwards for people, for other people's books. But uh, something about um, sitting down and writing about the things that, that you know that have affected you, it's a wonderful thing. It's a, a really lovely practice. And I find that I walk my dogs in the morning, come home, have breakfast, start writing, and uh, basically go on till 5.30, 6 o'clock in the evening without looking up. What do you think of this age of texting? I think it's great. And I think it's great that people are doing it on their machines rather than on paper and killing all those trees with nonsense. But don't you like the sense of... I love to write. But I think there's room for all of it. And I think, um, you know, what, what, I think there's a lot of, of course, mindless, useless texting, but there's always been a lot of kind of loose garbage. <laughs> I don't know my answer. What's your key to aging gracefully? Um, smiling. Trying to retain your sense of humor, uh, I think, smiling. You see the world funny? I think we have to try. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you like acting right away? Um, you like I've always the other... loved acting. I, I, I'm, I'm not so crazy about learning lines, but I really like acting. Was it hard to learn lines? 
no, it's not hard to learn lines. It's just boring um, <laughs> and sort of tedious. And it's uh, that's the one thing about acting I'm not so crazy about. But other than that, I love it all. Did you enjoy the television experience? To a degree. Did you like the show? I loved that I show. I liked the show very much, particularly the first year when yeah. uh, Teresa Rebeck was was uh, the creator showrunner. I think it had a, a, a really nice narrative, and I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the show when we all had a backstory and some great talent. Almost. That's right. Whoa. Wonderful, wonderful. Angelica will answer your questions in our final segment. Plus, we're talking about the best advice she's ever received. That's next. We're back with Angelica Houston. The book is A Story Lately Told. The next book is Watch Me, which takes us to the present, I would presume. Yes. And that will be out next That will be fall. out in, yeah, 2014. Uh, we have some uh, social media questions. Yamalu via Twitter wants to know, what is it like to work with Woody Allen and if the two of you are friends? Um, it was great working with Woody Allen. I really enjoyed it. I've done it twice. Um, I would say that um, when we see each other, we're friendly, but we don't really keep in touch. He's not the most open guy in the world. Um, no, I think he's he's quite introverted, um, although he was very friendly towards me. And um, with Woody, you know, he comes up to you and you're expecting some huge piece of directorial advice and he'll say, you'll be out of here by 4.30. <laughs> I've got a basketball game. That's so great. That's <laughs> Cox Sparrow on Instagram, do you have any fond memories from shooting the witches in the UK? Loved shooting the witches. The prosthetics <laughs> were a bit of a drawback, but, but um, I loved working with Nick Rogue and I would say for sort of full-blooded fun, on screen, I had the time of my life in that movie. Dave Dowling on Facebook wants to know what it's like being the third generation to win an Oscar. It feels great, just great. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the fourth generation of Houston's to win an Oscar. My, my nephew Jack is a beautiful actor, and uh, I'm uh, very Tony's proud of son? him. Yeah, uh, Tony's son, he's been doing Boardwalk Empire, and he also has been on, he's actually on stage in London now doing Strangers on a Train. So he's, he's got the stuff. Uh, Pamela Sue Love via Facebook. You are the best Morticia Adams in the world. Mm -hmm. How did you prepare for that? Well, I just read, read to you how I prepared. I've been in love with that part since I was five years old. Look back and laugh via Instagram. What's the most challenging role you've played? Um, well, I would say the grifters. Um, well, what a scene you had in that. Yeah. Who was the man who, who oh, was the actor? Oh, uh, um, Pat Hingle. Oh, wow. Yeah. He what a was movie fantastic. that was. fantastic. Great movie. Great movie. Great and of movie. course, John Cusack was, was phenomenal, and Annette Bening. It's a film noir. It's a film noir. <laughs> it's a great film, and, and I'm very proud of it, and it was a really fantastic part. Tough, though, huh? Tough. Yeah. Uh, let's finish the show with a little game called If You Only Knew. First boy you ever kissed? Joshua Thomas. Joshua Thomas. Was it in Ireland? No, it was in England. How old were you? Um, 12, 13. Where did it occur? Um, at a bonfire. Do you ever know in what... In the country. You ever know what... marshmallows. You ever know what happened to him? No. What was the best advice you ever got? Um, my dad. My dad said, remember, you can always put your hands in your pockets and walk away. That's good advice. Great advice. Yeah. Things that keep you up at night. Worries. What do you worry about most? Um, the people I love and my animals. Oh, you're an animal lover? Oh, yes. What do you have? Everything. Horses, dogs, chickens, <laughs> ducks. Where do you live? Pigs. <laughs> in <cats>. L.A.? <laughs> I, I live in L.A., but I have a, a ranch, a little farm. You're on a desert island. What three things do you want to have with you? Um... Really good library. Um, a really nice lover. 
<laughs> and, um, and protection. Do you have a lover now? No. Do you miss that? Yes. Do you look for it? No. Can you explain attract, or no one's ever, maybe you have the answer, attraction. Can you explain what that is, that? It has absolutely no rhyme, no reason. The only thing you can't plan for. The only thing you can't plan for. Could happen for. in 20 minutes. Could. But, you know, I'm always so fascinated by men because I think it happens to them ten times a day from what I read. <laughs> With me, I'm happy if it happens once a year. What do you look for most? Sense of humor. Was your father funny? Yes. Great. He was? Great fun. Great fun. Yeah. Great pa practical joker. What surprise possession you have? Um, my grandmother's ring. If you weren't an actor or a director, what would you be? A I'm gardener. I'm going to guess now, a gardener. I think probably a gardener. I or I'd work, I'd work with animals and gardens. Veterinarian. Yeah. Nah, not a veterinarian. Too, too sorrowful. I, I would, um, maybe I'd be a dog walker or something. Maybe I don't know. A very, very well-paid dog walker. <laughs> Maybe it'll come out in book two. Is there something no one knows about you? Yes. And they won't. <laughs> <laughs> You're great, Angelica. I See you love next you, Larry. year. Thank you so much. Thanks to our guest, Angelica Houston. A story lately told is available now, and Watch Me will be published next year. Remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. I'll see you next time.